Good afternoon, everybody. I'll go ahead and call the Committee on Growth and Infrastructure to order. Will the Secretary please call the roll? Senator Hammond? <clears throat> Senator Hansen? Senator Pizzina? Present. Senator Spearman? Here. Chair Harris? Here. Senator Hansen? Here. All right. Uh, please mark Senator Hammond present when he arrives. I know he is also in a, another committee that is overlapping. It is, in fact, that time of session, y'all. So uh, thank you so much for bearing with us. We're going to go ahead and open up the hearing on Senate Bill 303, which is sponsored by Senator Dondero Loop, and revises provisions relating to motor vehicles. Committee members, you should have an amendment. It was uploaded to Nellis. It is uploaded to Nellis, and so um, make sure that you are referencing that as we hear this bill. Senator, go ahead and uh, grab your seat and invite up any of your friends. And you all can go ahead and get started when you're ready. Good afternoon, Senator Harris, and thank you so much for having me. And I have lots of friends, but at least one of them here at the table has known me probably almost as long as I've been on the earth. So. Um, I appreciate you having us. Uh, Vice Chair P uh, Spearman and uh, members of the committee, I'm Marilyn Dondero Loop. For the record, I represent Senate District 8 in Clark County. Senate Bill 303 sets forth new requirements to calculate the compensation for warranty work or a recall service or repair that is completed by a dealer to ensure that the dealer has been fairly compensated for the work by the manufacturer. Any manufacturer of motor vehicles, including trailers or semi-trailers, is included under the provisions of this bill. This bill is detailed, and I would like to thank all the parties that have worked. That's why you have this uh, amendment that is uploaded, because we, even as of today, we're working hard on this bill. I will go through a couple of the provisions and sections of this bill, and then with me here are uh, Andy McKay and Gary Ackerman, who is the owner of God and Ford, and he will also uh, speak to some of the sections of this bill and give you some examples. Section 2 through 7 of SB 303 define a number of terms relating to the applicable parts and warranty work being performed. Section 8 provides that it is an unfair act or practice for a manufacturer to fail to compensate a dealer fairly for the work that they have performed and the expenses they incurred in performing the warranty work recall service or repair or to violate other provisions of sections 9 and uh, skip 10 and go 11 through 15. This section further provides that the compensation of labor at a rate that is equal to the prevailing retail labor rate multiplied by the time allowances in the guide used by the dealer as well as the dealer's cost for the parts. And I am going to stop there as I am not the expert and I will allow these two experts with me to introduce themselves again and talk a little bit about what this bill does and the importance of um, sponsoring and passing this bill for our auto dealers. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Committee. Thank you for your time. And uh, please don't hold my long-standing relationship with Senator Loop against her. Um, <laughs> um, I'm here today to uh, just briefly give you some background on this. Uh, the current legislation does provide for us to be uh, reimbursed. There seems to be, with some manufacturers, some confusion over the math involved. Um, and I, I don't mean to make light of that. It's a serious situation. Our, our industry's most difficult challenge today is recruiting and maintaining technicians to work on cars. And one of the problems we have um, in the Western United States is competing with other states. So as laws differ in those states, um, the competitive environment gets tilted. In, in this case, much to the state of Nevada's disadvantage. Our growth is, is uh, very well known in both ends of the state. Um, and we're having a very, very difficult time. Uh, my family's lucky enough to have been in the automobile business 101 years this year. So 
we run a family operation that tries to provide stability for our team members, um, but more importantly, stability for our customer base. So um, our uh, parts directors, both of whom are here today, both of our Ford parts directors, should you need to speak to them, uh, in an attempt to comply with our legislation, are asked by manufacturers sometimes to compile literally thousands of repair orders in stacks of paperwork this high um, to send back to headquarters so that they can compare them with the language in the law, and then they turn around and tell my parts directors that the law is ambiguous, um, and they use their own math. So that's what led us to ask for the language just to be changed a little bit and cleaned up so that there's no confusion over the intent of the law. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much for your time. Are you re ready for questions? M Madam Chair, uh, with your indulgence, uh, I have some comments for the record. And I know that Mr. Sandy uh, would like to follow me with respect to you're the chair with all deference, so uh, you, you've you been to growth and infrastructure before, yes? Yes, ma'am. Okay, as quickly as possible, please. That's the intent. Roger that. Uh, for the record, uh, Andrew McCam, the executive director of the Nevada Franchise Auto Dealers Association. Uh, first, and this is extremely important that I put this uh, on the record. Uh, thank um, both uh, the Alliance for Automotive Innovation as well as General Motors, uh, Mr. Kurt Augustine. Um, Mr. Alfredo Alonzo, as, as well as Mr. Jesse Wadhams. Um, we uh, started working on um, coming to um, commonality uh, on this bill two weeks ago, and uh, we were able to reach that this morning, and obviously you will see that uh, in the amendment itself, Madam Chair. Uh, very briefly, who are, these, who, who are your franchise auto dealers? Um, these are businessmen and women, as Mr. Ackerman indicated, that are entrenched in our communities. They're the fabric of where we live. Um, what do they do with respect to their impact in the community, not only from an economic standpoint, but also from a charitable aspect? Our, our, I'm proud to say, and I love to brag, of the fact that our dealer members donate literally millions and millions of dollars to various causes, ranging from autism treatment uh, to providing funding for schools, for uh, sports equipment, books, and you name it. Um, we're 20% approximately of the Nevada retail economy. Um, and in 2021, uh, total sales uh, exceeded $11.4 billion, which resulted in over half a billion dollars in sales tax revenue. Um, from a service standpoint, it's important to note the average dealer uh, in Nevada services just over 22,000 vehicles a year. Um, but most importantly, as is, is, is you will hear many of our um, speakers this is this is a jobs bill. This is the, this is an employee retention and compensation bill, and when you talk about what our impact is on that, the average employee at a franchise auto dealer uh, operation is eighty eight thousand dollars a year. So, the committee might be asking itself, well, why why are we in front of you to talk about uh, something as nebulous as retail, uh, or excuse me, compensation with respect to warranty and recall work? Well. Um, the legislature has found, and so has 49 other states, that's in the, in the public interest. And in fact, let me just read part of the legislative declaration in NRS uh, 42.310, which states, the legislature finds and declares that the distribution and sale of motor vehicles in the, in the state of Nevada vitally affects the general economy of the state and the public interest and the public welfare. Fast forwarding, and it says, starting off down the road, I know we're pinched for time, Madam Chair. You're headed so. in the wrong direction, Mr. McKay. Speed it up. Yes, please. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up in this, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I will simply say that what this does is brings Nevada on parity with other states. Uh, you guys have a copy of a map of states that have formulary language. Thank you, Senator Hansen. Uh, right now, Nevada and Texas are the two states that are considering it. Uh, so that would leave uh, three outliers. Um, we greatly appreciate the committee's uh, support of this measure. Um, obviously, we stand uh, ready for questions, and I know Mr. Sandy is behind me, and uh, with some of the more te technical stuff, he can, uh, he can answer them. So thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate you. Any opening comments from Mr. Sandy? Okay, great. You see? <laughs> committee members, do we have questions for our presenters?
You answered all our questions, Mr. McKay. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh -huh. No, thank you. Apologies, Madam Chair. Um, with your indulgence, we do have some uh, folks that would like to speak on the record. Um, shall we step away from the table and... Can we get them in support testimony? Yes, ma'am. All right, lovely. If you'd like to testify in support of Senate Bill 303, go ahead and step up, fill up the chairs here in Carson. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. For the record, Danny Thompson, representing myself. Um, this is as much a consumer bill as it is a fairness bill. I, I had ordered a truck from a dealership in Henderson. After they couldn't deliver the truck to me, I found the exact same truck in Reno. I drove to Reno. I bought the truck in Reno. I drove it back to Las Vegas. After about a month, the truck developed a very serious problem. I took it back to the dealer who I did not buy it from. They attempted to fix it, gave it back to me. The problem wasn't resolved. I took it back two other times. Um, the, the manufacturer told me it was the dealership. I knew it wasn't the dealership because I was talking to them every day. The truck was in the shop for six weeks. Um, ultimately, it was resolved. And the reason was, after they had tried to program the computer, it was painfully clear that it had to be replaced. They had to get clearance from the manufacturer. In this case, it was Ford uh, to replace that very expensive part. It took six weeks for that to happen. I bought the warranty on the truck from Ford, and the, real, the, the, the person in Henderson didn't make a penny off the thing, and so it's only fair that, you know, that they be compensated fairly because in a business that loses money on one part of the business, they have to cost shift to another part of the business, and then some other consumer gets hurt. So this really is a consumer bill, and I would urge, urge you to vote in favor of it. Thank you. Hello, thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Kevin Bonsignori. I'm the parts director at Godden Ford. I've been there for 32 years. This is a bill that, in my opinion, is long overdue. Um, it's something that's been on my radar for over 20 years. Um, our law certainly or currently states that we're, the manufacturer is to, re, to reimburse us at retail rates for our warranty parts. However, when it comes to it, our, our, the way it's currently written, it doesn't state how you come to that number. So for, uh, for our manufacturer, they make us jump through a lot of hoops. They want us to see part-by-part -part records, RO by RO, like Mr. Ackerman said, literally two, three-foot stacks of paper that I'm spending two and three people spending full time for the whole month putting these things together. And at the end of the day, we get reimbursed an amount that's less than what it cost us to put the, the, the um, information together. It's something that's really important to us because we are competing with um, other dealerships in our area and from other states um, for employees. It's harder for us to be able to compensate our employees the way other dealers can because they're making more money on their warranty. Um, that's about it for now. Thanks so much for your time. Good afternoon, Chair Harris and members of the committee. I promise I'll go quick as well. <laughs> For the record, my name is Nick Schneider, representing the Vegas Chamber. Uh, the Vegas Chamber is in support of SB 303, as we believe this creates an overall fair ecosystem uh, that ensures fair compensation and limits the financial risk exposure for our local auto dealers uh, in regards to manufacturer defects. Uh, we especially appreciate that this outlines a process to establish and mediate a fair rate for manufacturers to reimburse these local auto dealers, and we urge your support of SB 303. Thank you so much. All right. Okay. Um, is there anyone else in Carson City besides the gentleman who just sat? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yes, my name is Dennis Fichetti. I'm with a local car dealership. I'm a shop foreman. Um, just wanted to let you know how important this law is to pass um, in regards to retention for dealership technicians. Um, it's a trade that's probably by far the most expensive to get in and to be able to advance yourself. Um, theoretically, throughout a, a physical year, a dealership technician um, will see two, typically two years advance in one. Um, the amount of resources that we have to go through between the expansion of hybrid as well as electric, um, it's becoming more and more expensive to be able to maintain and and ed educate ourselves. Now the warranty times have decreased over the years. Um, 
and we would like to hopefully be able to be compensated so that we can continue in our profession. Thank you. I am Matthew Hole, representing Michael Hole Automotive here in Carson City, and I'd just kind of like to echo what the others have said as far as allowing us to uh, attract quality technicians and compete fairly with the other states. You know, we are on the border of California, and it allows us to get, or it will allow us to get uh, pay raises for people so we don't lose them back to California and allow us, as this gentleman said, to continue to train them in, in, in a career path that is a wonderful career these days. And our industry is, is a challenge to get young people into that position, and we'd love to be able to compensate them fairly. That is all. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll go to Las Vegas. Anyone in Las Vegas looking to testify and support us? Senate Bill 303. Not seeing anyone. BPS, can we check the phones, please? If you'd like to testify in support on SB 303, please press star nine on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for support at this time. Okay, uh, we'll come back here to Carson City. Anyone like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 303? All right, not seeing anyone. Also, uh, not seeing anyone come to the table in Las Vegas. Okay, BPS, can you check the phone for opposition to Senate Bill 303, please? If you'd like to testify in opposition on SB 303, please press star 9 on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers wishing to testify in opposition at this time. Okay, how about the neutral position? Uh, Chair, uh, members of the committee, Alfredo Alonso uh, with the law firm of Lewis and Roca uh, today on, on behalf of the Alliance for Automobile. Uh, innovation. And I have uh, with me uh, Kurt Augustine, who is Senior Director of Government Affairs uh, for the Alliance, and uh, uh, Jesse Wadhams, uh, who is representing uh, GM. And uh, as you heard earlier, this has been a, a, a lot of hard work uh, in trying to, to get uh, common ground with, uh, uh, with the dealers and the industry, and I think we we have that, and I'll uh, uh, turn it over to uh, Kurt uh, uh, in case he has any questions, or in case you have any questions, uh, we hope to be able to answer them. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, my name is Kurt Augustine. I'm the uh, Director of Government Affairs for the Alliance for Automotive Innovation. And we want to thank the sponsor of the bill for her willingness to help us craft a, a fair uh, compromise that uh, both respects the concerns of the dealers as well as the auto manufacturers that I represent. Also, I want to thank uh, Mr. McKay, the dealers, and the association uh, in our combined goal of trying to bring the state of Nevada's laws uh, more consistent with the uh, remainder of the country to help address some of the issues primarily on the uh, warranty reimbursement. And we just want to thank very, and again, uh, we were. Uh, in strong opposition of the original version of the bill, but through its diligent work has been noted, uh, we have gone to a neutral position now. So thank you very much. And Madam Chair, Jesse Wadhams with the law firm of Black and Wadhams representing General Motors. And unless you have some questions, I'll leave it at that. Well done, sir. Um, no, I don't think we'll, we'll be taking any questions for uh, folks in the neutral today, okay? Thank you all so much. Anyone else here in Carson City who'd like to testify in the neutral position? Okay. Anyone in Las Vegas in the neutral position? And BPS, can we check the phones, please? If you'd like to testify in neutral on SB 303, please press star 9 on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for neutral at this time. All right, Senator Dundera Loop. 
Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and committee members again. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to note that we had several people on the line, but due to the uh, concern for time, we sort of have one big ditto for about 10 to 12 people. So um, uh, please make note of that. And, you know, while the provisions of this bill are very detailed and the focus of this bill is very straightforward to ensure when a dealer performs warranty work on behalf of a manufacturer, they are compensated fairly for the work that has been done. And, you know, the car piece, I, I have to tell you, I've had a couple people say, why are you doing an auto bill? Well, first of all, they've forgotten that I was chair of transportation when uh, Senator and I were on the other side. But also, be, I think what's important to note is one thing that has already been noted, but I want to um, sort of personalize this. These are, these are people that I grew up with. I've, I've literally known Gary Ackerman since I was like six years old. And, and the Finleys, the Coles, these are, these are families that have invested in our communities as not only a business, but they have invested in giving back to the community. And so I just always think that it's incredibly f important to share that with people so that they know that um, when I do these bills, I'm not just doing them because somebody randomly asked me to. I'm truly doing them because I believe in them and I believe in the work that they've done in our communities and I think that they should be compensated fairly. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I really appreciate all of you today under this time crunch that we're in, so thank you very much. All right, thank you, Senator. With that, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on Senate Bill 303 and open up the hearing on Senate Bill 349, which revises provisions relating to document preparation services. We're gonna go ahead and uh, just stand in a brief recess while we allow the committee to clear and wait for our bill sponsor. All right, committee, we'll come back to order. Uh, we've already opened the hearing, Senator, so go ahead and be begin when you're ready. Good afternoon. The incredibly hardworking committee on growth and infrastructure. The even harder working committee on government affairs um, had me tied to my chair. Senator Edgar Flores, for the record, proudly representing Senate District 2, and I am here to present Senate Bill 349. I am joined by Mr. Rafael Arroyo, who I think you've had an opportunity now to speak and meet with 
Um, I will be handing over the presentation briefly to him. Also joining me is uh, Maggie Salas from our Secretary of State's office. Um, for the portion of the conversation dealing with Mr. Rafael Arroyo, um, we will be working directly off of Senate Bill 349. Uh, there is an amendment to this bill that you likely saw, and that we will hand over that portion of the presentation to Ms. Salas. Um, I've had now the opportunity since the 2015 legislative session to work uh, in some level uh, it, within the doc prep uh, section of the NRS. Uh, namely, when I first started this conversation was because we had a lot of issues with fraud, folk pretending to be attorneys, um, and bad, some, some bad apples that we wanted to take care of. Um, but since 2015 to now, a lot of the work that we've been doing in this doc prep section is clarif clarifying how we can better help the good actors, the folk that are doing things right. How do we help those small businesses? Uh, I've had now an opportunity to converse with Mr. Arroyo for several years in, in conversations about what he does. And uh, he'll do that a little bit in more detail. But one of the things that we, we did in the past that we need to correct is that there's a, lot of, there's a whole host of folk that don't like going to the DMV. DMV is one of those uh, uh, phrases or, or uh, acronyms that anytime you say it, um, people have some horror stories, being there for many, many hours, um, some paperwork, unfortunately, not making its way through the system, and all of a sudden something didn't work out, and or just the dreaded uh, uh, driving test for, you know, for our young youth in Nevada. I, I mention that because there is a necessity uh, for, for folk to fill, uh, thir uh, third party to fill that uh, void of how do I avoid going to the DMV? And there is a whole industry that has been built around that where either you're too busy, you're too scared, or you're too X, Y, Z to go to the DMV, uh, there's a third party that can help you with that. And um, it's difficult for you to be a third party DMV service provider without saying you're a DMV service provider. There's just no real way of saying it. Uh, you know, we've thought of creative ways but you have to put that in your title. You have to put that in your advertisement to help these small businesses. Let the world know that we are here to provide you a service if you're trying to avoid to go to the DMV. Now, understandably, we don't want scenarios where folk are misleading or confusing the community to think that somehow they are uh, associated with the DMV or part of the, uh, the agency. Um, with that, uh, this is how this bill came about. This is why we are here. We want to ensure that uh, DMV services can advertise themselves as such and that they clearly are putting information in their advertisement to say, by the way, we're not affiliated with the DMV. That's not the exact technical terminology of the NRS that we put in here, but that's the crux of this conversation. Um, Ms. Uh, uh, Maggie Salas will get into the very detailed conversation involving uh, document preparation services and how I believe we can help the Secretary of State's office uh, engage in that conversation more meaningfully because over the years we've been putting a lot of teeth into how we can go after some of these bad actors, the folk that are directly competing with Mr. Arroyo at times um, but aren't following the rules. So what we want to make sure is that the Secretary of State's office has some teeth so that they can go after them. Um, but before we go to, the, uh, to Ms. Salas, I would like to hand over the presentation to Mr. Arroyo. Uh, thank you, Senator Flores. Uh, my name is Rafael Arroyo. Uh, for the record, I'm the president of the Registration Services Association of Nevada. And I'll just tell you guys a little history about the registration services industry here. The registration services industry has over 80 small businesses in the Reno and Carson slash Las Vegas area. It's a group of mostly minority and women owned businesses who are licensed as document preparers by the Secretary of State. And we process DMV transactions uh, on behalf of customers. So if you, know, you buy a vehicle used on the street, we can do that for you. Um, you buy a vehicle from a dealer out of state, we can also do that for you. We do handicap placards, all kinds of different um, registration and DMV services for people, as Senator Flores said, that don't have the time to go down there or any other reason. Um, uh, the industry has been advocating for 
um, you know, better partnership with DMV for, for a long time, but it only made really significant progress through the legislative process. Um, in 2019, the DMV passed a bill, AB 63, that, AB 63, excuse me, that prohibited the use, advertising, or promoting a business using any name or likeness of the department. And by definition, this law made any business using the letters DMV in their name or advertising illegal. Uh, after the law went into effect, it was being enforced on only new businesses that were forming and joining the industry. The DMV had communicated that they were going to um, start enforcing this law, but they would give the industry a heads up 30 to 45 days. As the senator said, the purpose of SB 349 is to establish a compromise with the DMV where industry members can still communicate their message of offering DMV registration services, but not insinuate to customers that they are the DMV. The law will allow industry members to use the letters DMV, but only if it is followed by the words services or registration services. It will also have industry members state that they are a third party business not affiliated with DMV. Uh, the compromise has been discussed with DMV leadership and agreed to by all the parties. Uh, this compromise is going to benefit both the DMV and clients. It will reduce the need for some clients to come directly to the DMV offices for registration services and facilitate timely registrations for clients who need access to local registration service sites and thus avoiding late fees and other issues that they may encounter. Um, SB 349 offers you know your constituents a choice um, for their DMV services and I know that uh, the representative from the Secretary of State's office is going to talk about an amendment. Um, this is an amendment that we're working on uh, with them um, actively and it is to put some teeth into um, the laws on the books for the bad actors. We want to have some sort of structure uh, for penalties, and we're actively working on that together. And, uh, you know, we should come to a resolution quickly on that for you guys. I know there's deadlines. Thank you. Committee members, any questions? It, Madam Chair, and I apologize. Oh. If I may hand it over just so that our uh, Ms. Ms. Salas can go through the conceptual amendment that was provided to the committee. Yes, and, and my, my apologies, Senator Flores, you did mention that you wanted her to speak to that amendment uh, before we get started. So, yes, let's go ahead and go down to Las Vegas, please. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Harris and members of the Senate Committee on Government Infrastructure. Uh, my name is Maggie Salas Crespo, and I serve as the Deputy Secretary of State for Southern Nevada. Uh, in this role, I oversee Document Preparation Services Program within the Office of the Secretary of State. Um, first, I would like to start off by thanking Senator Flores and Mr. Arroyo for uh, working with our office on this conceptual amendment, uh, which will streamline compliance for the program. Um, the proposed amendments came from language borrowed from Nevada Revised Statute NRS 2 40, which is notary law. Um, it has been our experience that most notary publics are document preparation services and vice versa. Therefore, conceptual amendments I will be presenting today seek to bring uniformity in the compliance of these two programs. Um, the first section that I'm going to cover is uh, the proposed changes to NRS 240A100. Um, which covers registration requirements. Uh, the proposed amendment would address fines that can be brought forward for misrepresenting themselves as document preparation services without being properly registered with their office. Uh, this would allow our office to assess a fine no more than 1,000 for each violation. Um, before I continue, I do want to um, mention that none of the fines are being increased. Those fines are already in statute. So as I continue to read these fines, those are fines that are already exist within our statute. Uh, the next conceptual amendment would be for NRS 240A-150, uh, which addresses advertisement for services in the statement document preparation services must display. Um, this amendment allows our office to assess fines for document preparation services improperly advertising themselves or for giving legal advice. It also defines the statement. Uh, it also clarifies the statement that they must display to include that they cannot accept fees for giving legal advice. This will allow our office to assess a fine no more than 1,000 for each violation and or suspend or revoke the registration. A uh, conceptual amendment to NRS 248-240 um, addresses prohibited acts by registrants. Uh, this amendment will allow our office to suspend or revoke the registration of a document preparation service or assess a fine of no more than 1,000 for each violation. A uh, conceptual amendment to NRS 240A-260 um, uh, which addresses investigations by, um, 
by alleged violations and penalties for our office can bring forward. Uh, this amendment would change the order in which we can proceed with, uh, with violations. Uh, currently, even in clear instances of violation, like operating without properly uh, being registered as a document preparation services, we cannot proceed with the fine without first conducting a hearing. This section was added to our statute by Assembly Bill 240 from the 2021 legislative session, uh, which was brought forward by then Assemblyman Flores. Um, the amendment would remove the requirement to first conduct a hearing before imposing a fine. Um, I do want to note that this does not mean the, the hearings process would be completely revoked or removed. It would still be part of our compliance process, but it would give us a flexibility on how we enforce the law. Uh, this amendment also allows the Secretary of State to refuse to register, renew, or suspend or revoke the registration of a document preparation services who do not collaborate with their office on investigation for alleged violations. A uh, conceptual amendment to NRS 248 to 70, which addresses uh, actions to be taken by the Secretary of State for violations of this chapter. Uh, this amendment would allow the Secretary of State's office to propose, uh, to, I'm sorry, to proceed without denying, uh, with denying, suspending, revoking, or refusing to renew a registration pending a hearing uh, if our office believes it is in the interest or necessary to protect the public. Again, the hearings process would still be available. Uh, the last one is conceptual amendment to, uh, to overall our chapter, NRS 240. Uh, this conceptual amendment would require registrants to report changes to their information to the Secretary of State's office and allow our office to assess a $10 fee if a reprint of a certificate or registration is needed due to name change of the registrant. I do want to note that our NAC 248040 requires registrants to do this already. Uh, authority for NAC 248 040 was drawn from the original language which was established this program in 2013. However, it is not clearly stated in the NRS. Uh, this concludes the proposed conceptual amendments by the Secretary of State's office. I do want to note that these amendments do not change or increase the fines that are already set in statute once again. Uh, the main purpose of these amendments is to streamline compliance uh, and allow our office to assess fines for violations in a speedier manner. Since the creation of Document Preparation Services Program, uh, the focus of our investigators has been to bring people into compliance. Now, however, uh, we, we are left to deal with those who refuse to comply, and these changes will allow us to assess fines on these bad actors. Uh, we are thankful for Senator, to Senator Flores for working with us and for the members of this industry for sharing their concerns. Uh, we will continue to collaborate with Document Preparation uh, Services registrants and Senator Flores, and additional changes may be proposed to ensure we address any of those concerns. Um, I stand ready for questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm hoping you can get those changes wrapped up as soon as possible as the deadline is Friday, and I do not intend to have a Friday meeting, so the deadline is Wednesday just as a fair heads up to everyone. All right, uh, Senator Flores, are you ready for questions at this time? Committee members, any questions for the Senator? Are you allowing us to have? <laughs> yes, this is your chance to ask questions. Right, Senator Hansen. <laughs> Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, actually, it brings back a bunch of, was it your bill, Edgar, uh, the notary public thing? Remember, in, in, mainly in Mexico, a notary public is more like a legal office. Okay, because no, when she mentioned that, I go, oh, I remember all that now. Well, the question I have is, in your case, you and I visited earlier, and your service is basically to keep me from standing in line at DMV and doing it for me. Um, what, but you mentioned there are competitions that are not, competitors that are not following the law, bad actors. What, how do bad actors, I mean, is there a law that says I can't take a registration form from her and go stand in line at the DMV and get her vehicle registered? I mean, what is the law that's actually being broken by competitors? I'm just kind of curious. Uh, Raphael Arroyo, for the record. It's, it's more of people basically ripping, like, you know, like the DMV logo and website and saying that they're an authorized DMV representative where the industry is, you know, we're a third-party service. We're not licensed by the DMV. Um, and then that, that's the problem, right? So just fraudulent but, advertising? Yeah, more just, than, yeah. I mean, they're just, not, there's no law right now against letting somebody stand in line from, from my registration? No, tech, no. Te I mean, technically, if you prepare uh, documents for someone, you would you have to. need to say your name for the oh, record. Sorry, Raphael Arroyo for the record again. Uh, technically, if you're preparing documents for someone, then you need to be licensed as a document preparer, but you can register a car for your family member or something. If you okay. have the right no, forms. I, I was just yeah. curious about that. Yeah. So thank you, Madam Chair, for the indulgence. Absolutely. And it sounds like we, we have additional comments down south. Go ahead. 
Uh, yes, Maggie Salas Grispa, for the record, I just wanted to add to uh, the question and the answer there. Um, uh, in fact, if anybody is preparing any sort of documentation and going to the DMV to present documentations on behalf of someone else, they do have to properly register with the Secretary of State. So they, they're uh, and to uh, to your question, Senator, uh, there are some bad actors out there who are not properly registered with the Secretary of State and are taking people's uh, personal identifiable information uh, and payment to go do this. So you know, in part with uh, and and part of that is also advertisement, right? And they they might not advertise they might advertise themselves as doing these services but are not properly registered with the Secretary of State. So this partnership with Mr. Arroyo is really to to bring down on these on these uh, bad actors and ensure that everybody is complying with law and that the Secretary of State's office is able to issue fines for those clear violations not like not being properly registered or uh, not advertising as they should. Thank you for that clarification. Committee members additional questions. Okay, not seeing any, we'll go ahead and open it up for testimony. Anyone here to testify in support of Senate Bill 349, go ahead and come on forward. All right, not seeing anyone down in Las Vegas. Anybody want to testify in support of Senate Bill 349? Here's your chance. Okay, BPS, can you check the phones quickly, please? Senate Bill 349, support testimony. If you'd like to testify on SB 349, please press star 9 on your phone to take your place in the queue. Caller, you're unmuted and you may begin. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Sarah Marks. My company is My Car Lady Automotive Business Services. I'm a third party DMV registration service registered with Document Prep and Nevada SOS. I want to be very supportive of this bill and also giving the opportunity to the SOS to put teeth into the bad actors who are not following the rules that they have put forward, including proper receipts and documentation for the type of work that's being promised, the amount of money that's being charged, and even a return of fee policy, which I see the result of when individuals come to me having been ripped off by companies that represent themselves as DMV third-party services who aren't. I also welcome the opportunity to be able to say DMV rather than MVD or tag agency when identifying the type of work that my company does. So thank you very much to the senators and assembly people for putting this forward and getting it cleaned up and getting the bad actors out of our business. Thank you. Here are there are no more callers in support at this time. All right, thank you. Anyone here in Carson City would like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 349? Not seeing any. Down in Las Vegas, any opposition testimony for Senate Bill 349? No one coming forward. BBS, can we check the phones, please? If you'd like to testify in opposition on SB 349, please press star 9 on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for opposition at this time. All right. Um, let's go ahead and go to neutral. Anyone here in Carson City want to testify in the neutral position? Senate Bill 349. Okay, not seeing anyone. Las Vegas, anyone in the neutral position? Okay, BPS, can we check the phones, please, for anyone who'd like to give neutral testimony on Senate Bill 349? If you'd like to testify in neutral on SB 349, please press star 9 on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for neutral at this time. Okay. Uh, unless you have any closing comments, Senator, we'll go ahead and close the hearing on Senate Bill 349 and open up the hearing on Senate Bill 424, which revises provisions relating to the Nevada Transportation Authority. Oh, yes. <laughs> Once again, Madam Chair, 
esteemed colleagues, I am Senator Edgar Flores, here to uh, present Senate Bill 424. I don't know if I have somebody from business and industry or the NTA. I've asked him to join me, not for purposes of co-presenting, but only to provide some expert testimony should you have technical questions under NRS 706. I don't know that we have them here, but I will go into my presentation and they may make their way uh, to the building. So, petition for leave to intervene. Something I had never personally engaged in. It wasn't something I cared about. Uh, during the interim, um, like many of you do, I was working with uh, a coalition of community members and electeds who were, um, we were trying to find solutions for our constituents, uh, particularly for folk in North and East Las Vegas. And we thought that it makes sense to engage in conversations, not just with legislators, but also with county commissioners, city council members, because we thought if we could have a holistic approach to conversations that are impacting our community, we could maybe collectively all work together towards solutions. And amongst those conversations, we were, we were conversing about, particularly during the, the pandemic, we were engaging in conversation about how uh, a lot of us had elderly parents, family members who uh, live, it, live with us. And this is very true, particularly uh, in, in Latino households, but it's also true uh, with, with our black community, Asian community, and many others where it is very normal for your parents and grandparents to live in a single home. Um, and while the adults uh, uh, in the room may go off to work, they serve as a family uh, kind of protection with the minors. Maybe you have a small baby and grandma's there to take care of the baby. By the same token, uh, because we're off working, there's a lot of scenarios where unfortunately say, uh, grandma needs to go to uh, get a, uh, pick up her medication, or maybe has to go to the grocery store. These are all non-emergency uh, non medical transportation uh, providers that would fill in that void. They come to your home, can pick somebody up, take them to a senior center or a senior daycare uh, to do certain activities. But this is who we were talking about, and I met folk that were trying to get licensed. This is the first time I had ever interacted or heard of the uh, Nevada Transportation Authority, and I said, that's great, we'll write a bunch of letters of support. I start with that because they're started a very frustrating journey for me where a bunch of letters of support uh, from many members of this body, uh, members of the city council, members of the county commission, went ignored. And so what I thought is, well, wait a minute, maybe there is a problem with the applicant. So then I reached out to the NTA and tried to understand how the application process works. And that's when I f first learned of this petition for leave to intervene. Here's how it works. There's three folk that sit on the commission. We just had a recent appointment uh, of the new chairman. Um, and I am an applicant. I want to engage in non-emergency transportation services. And I'm using that as a hypothetical because the NTA captures more uh, applications. Uh, but I am using that one as an example because I was personally involved from A to Z with the conversation. They present it. Within X amount of days, the NTA will publish notice, the, similarly to how you would see in a newspaper, and they'll say, hey, person A is interested in engaging in this activity. And then within X amount of days from that, uh, folk who have a direct and substantial interest in a proceeding can file uh, a petition for leave to intervene. Now, direct and substantial interest is pretty much anyone. The problem is, and, it, and, and the intervener process is used in a lot of different worlds, in a lot of different uh, uh, conversations. But in the NTA, in my opinion, it is a system that is abused strictly to stop competition, period. Here's why I'm saying that. The NTA, right now, when an applicant files their application for whatever it may be, they review their financials they do a background check. And then on top of that, they can request a whole host of, of, of additional docs just to ensure that that applicant 
is worthy of coming into this space. What happens is person B sees that newspaper printing and they say, wait a minute, that person's trying to compete with me. So person B, because anyone with a direct and substantial interest can file an intervener, files it. And then starts a dance that can take 16, 17, 18, 19 months. This one took 16 months. 16 months for a legitimate business who passed the background check, financials, provided every single document the NTA requested. And the intervener process became a, a, simply a tool to hinder competition. By any stretch of the imagination, I know sitting on this committee we have folk who are involved in different arenas, but I, I, I would make the example uh, to uh, if you own a plumbing company, that if in a plumbing scenario you could have a business say, well, wait a minute, that new plumber is trying to come in here and is going to compete with me. I'm going to file an intervener, and I'm going to make it incredibly difficult, 16, 19 months of lawyer fees, of, of headaches, so that that individual can't come and compete with me. I say the same thing. Imagine lawyers had this. We don't need any more attorneys. We don't want anybody com competing with us. And we have this intervener process. I make the argument to this committee that it is unnecessary in the NTA. That is strictly a process that is anti-capitalism and it goes against the very notion of what we stand for when we talk about being a pro-business Nevada, a pro-small business uh, uh, town where we help folk navigate the system and can instantaneously get their license. So with my bill, I seek to, to rectify years of abuse. Now, the folk that have been taken advantage of, and I'm talking about small businesses who, who quit halfway through the process because they just couldn't afford the attorney to continue this fight. And these are folk that were trying to become movers. These were folk that were just trying to move folk from point A to point B. The most frustrating part about the intervener process now is that it gives a discovery phase where, in essence, they give a license to the current market participant, the current business, to say, I want to see what contracts you have. I want to see what potential client list you have. I want to make sure you have all that. And then if and often they are effective in keeping that person from coming and getting their application approved, what happens then is that person then looks at all their potential client lists, looks at all those contracts and calls them. Hey, by the way, I, I heard that you were hoping to get this contract with them. They didn't get their license, but guess what? You can, you can utilize me. Oh, I heard that you were trying to get this done, and I saw their contract. I, let me, let me uh, before you even move forward with that, let me right now undercut them, and I will do it for cheaper. This is, this is what happens now. My draw hit, hit the ground when I got example after example after example that this is the way we've been operating in the state of Nevada. Um, it is frustrating. It is unbelievable at times for me, quite frankly. Um, and uh, I hope some of the small businesses, and again with the chaos today, some of the folks that have gone through this nightmare may not be able to call in in time, but uh, this is what we're hoping to do. I want to get rid of the intervener process, period. The reason I want to get rid of that is I don't want to create, I don't want to continue to have this platform for uh, uh, businesses to misutilize the intervener process simply to, to hinder business and competition. And instead, I want to uh, give the NTA more power and authority to, for them to do their job um, and, and put the emphasis there. So we will continue to have that hearing. An applicant applies. They will then notify, uh, they will notify anybody that's interested. This individual is trying to come into this space. They will do their background check. They will check financials. The NTA will do their due diligence. If there is still some confusion, if they're still unsure whether or not that company is ready to take on whatever responsibility of whatever application they're, they're, they're filing, what they'll do is they will then maybe have a, a public hearing. Nothing during that entire process stops a second company or a interested party from saying, hey, by the way, I know you're considering this application. Here's a whole host of things we think you should consider. Here's, here's some concerns we have. We've worked with that person in the past. They may be a bad actor, whatever it may be. They can still provide that to the NTA. 
and they can take the, all that into consideration. But what's not going to happen is we're not going to have a process that creates a dance that only some can participate in and keeps out competition. Uh, and we, this should have been addressed long ago, and, and it hasn't. And, and I am here to, to provide that solution for future businesses who are trying to come into this space. Um, and with that, Madam Chair and members of the committee, uh, I am open for any questions you may have. Committee members, Senator Hanson. Almost more of a statement. Uh, great presentation. Reminds me of the Uber Taxi Cab Authority, if you remember a few years back. But I got to warn you, Senator, you're starting, to, you're starting to sound awful like a Republican. You better be <laughs> careful here. No, it sounds like a great bill. I agree completely with your, your premise. Whenever we can find these sorts of uh, bottlenecks that occur where you can literally use government authorities to, to stop businesses from legitimately uh, participating in the marketplace, absolutely, let's get rid of those bottlenecks. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Hansen, for that, uh, for that comment. Uh, Senator Edgar Flores, for the, for the record, I forgot to mention one point. When an application is submitted to the NTA and once all the requirements are fulfilled, the staff or, and the legal counsel will make a recommendation saying, look, everything's been met, we think this looks good, and it goes, that then goes to uh, the three commissioners. The three commissioners can still go against the recommendation made, and they can still have a hearing, and they can still do a whole host of things. They still have all that authority. I just want to take the authority away uh, from prolonging a process from those that are just trying to, to utilize this process as a way to hinder competition. All right. Uh, not seeing any additional questions from committee members, we will go ahead and go to testimony. Anyone here in Carson City like to testify in support Senate Bill 424? Okay, don't see anyone in Las Vegas, Senate Bill 424. All right, BPS, can we check the phones for support testimony for Senate Bill 424, please? If you'd like to testify in support on SB 424, please press star 9 on your phone to take your place in the queue. Wiz Rosard, W-I-Z-R-O-U-Z-A-R-D, Deputy State Director with American for Prosperity Nevada. We stand proudly to support Senate Bill 424. We applaud the bill sponsor, Edgar Flores, for having the courage to recognize, regardless of how small the industry may be, how small the player may be, when we talk about a free market capitalist society, we must, we must stand to ensure that the process is applied equally across the board. To recognize a process such as what we've seen with Nevada Transportation Authority and to propose a bill such as Senate Bill 424, where it opens up the process through a hearing, ensures that every entrepreneur, regardless of how small or how big, have an opportunity to ensure that their pursuit of happiness by way of a permit is respected. And we applaud the Senator for doing so. And I agree with you, Senator Hansen. Capitalism is a beautiful thing when it's done appropriately. And what we try to do is ensure cronious policies like what's currently in place are removed. So we urge you to support Senate Bill 424 and we applaud you, Senator Flores, for taking the first step in ensuring that all voices are heard and ensuring that the process is protected. Thank you, y'all have a great day. Good afternoon. My name is Patricia Erickson. I'm the administrative attorney at the Nevada Transportation Authority. I am out of state, but I was asked to appear. I'm not in. I'm not supporting or not supporting or in opposition, but was going to answer any questions that anyone had. Uh, while we have you, hopefully you're still on the phone, I just wanted to double check, see if there's any committee members who have questions for the NTA since they are the agency. Senator Spearman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I guess my question would be, in light of the testimony that we heard from Senator Flores, uh, someone actually calling and undercutting the price, it seems like that is a supreme ethics violation. And so are there any 
statute, standards, or is any way for disciplinary action? I cannot say that during the 18 months that I have been at the MTA that I have learned of anyone doing that. We have heard of it, but there has never been a complaint directed to us. That would be very inappropriate. I don't know what kind of ramifications would arise from it, but it would not, it would need to be investigated. Just hold. So, so you all have a, an investigative arm that is actually looking into this? We have an investigative arm. Name for uh, the record, please, ma'am. Enforcement ma Division. I'm sorry. My name is Patricia Erickson. I'm the Nevada, I mean, Administrative Attorney at the Nevada Transportation Authority. We have an, an Enforcement Division in both Reno and Las Vegas who investigate public complaints to investigate violations of NRS 706, NRA, NAC 706, and then 706A. If anyone learned of that, if that practice was going on and if a complaint was made, our, our investigators would be assigned and they would investigate it. As I said, I've only been at the agency for one 18 months and I have not heard that we had any specific complaint regarding that uh, problem. Okay. okay, I have a quick question for you uh, that I'm hoping you might be able to answer. Are you aware of how long it typically takes the Transportation Authority to do its investigation and in deciding whether to issue a, uh, a CPC? Um, yes, ma'am. If there is not a petition Name for, for the record. to intervene, the process is sorry, Patricia Erickson, Administrative Attorney for the Nevada Transportation Authority. Um, if there is not a petition for leave to intervene filed, the process is quite quick. It can be done within, I would say, completed within four to six months and sometimes even quicker than that. It just depends on the financial investigation that has to be completed. But the staff of the NTA are very dedicated. They work very hard on getting these things taken care of quickly. But the process can be extremely, um, it can be extended when a petition for leave to intervene uh, has been filed. And do you have, um and it doesn't have to be precise. This is not about, you know, how, how well the NTA is doing or not doing. I'm just looking for a general sense of how things are operating today. When a PLTI uh, petition for leave to intervene is filed, uh, approximately how long does the process take? I know you said four to six months or so um, when there is no uh, PLTI, but do you have a kind of just general window of when a PLTI is filed, how long it takes? I would say generally one year. I'm sorry, was that one year? I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am, Patricia Erickson. Yes, I would say that it, it would generally be, since I've been there, it's taken about a year. Okay, thank you so much. Committee members, additional questions for the NTA? All right, not seeing any. Uh, we will go ahead and move to opposition testimony. Anyone here in Carson City in opposition to Senate Bill 424? Okay, anyone in Las Vegas opposition to Senate Bill 424? Good afternoon, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Kimberly Maxson Rushton. I'm with the law firm Cooper Levinson, and I'm appearing on behalf of the Livery Operators Association of Las Vegas. Um, we politely and professionally oppose the bill based on the value and importance of the intervener process and what it serves in order to protect the traveling public here in the state of Nevada. I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about the specifics of how the intervener process works. For the committee's edification, the intervener process is one that's governed solely by regulation. It's under Nevada's administrative code, specifically 706. 
And in that regulatory scheme, it specifically precludes interveners from intervening for the purpose of stifling competition. In fact, it orders the NTA to not allow an intervener in instances in which it is filed solely for the purposes of anti-competition. Additionally, an intervener may not be allowed to participate in a matter if it's demonstrated that their intent was, again, anti-competitive or meant to only undo unduly delay the process or overly burden it. And what that means, Chairman and members of the committee, is that the presiding officer at the NTA has the sole discretion when to allow an intervener into a matter and to set the parameters as to what type of participation in the application or any matter that they intervene on to what degree that they may participate. So specifically at the time that the intervener process is initiated, an applicant must demonstrate a direct and substantial interest. Those are legal terms of art which require that you state specifically and concisely what areas of the application you believe are infirm or inconsistent with the law and what you as the intervener intend to add that is not otherwise anti-competitive. Thereafter, the discovery that is allowed or not allowed is set by the presiding officer. I've participated in matters both as an applicant uh, counsel as well as counsel for an intervener, and it varies whether or not the presiding officer will allow the intervener to conduct discovery. In, the, in other instances, it's extremely important to note the fact that gouging or poaching business during the application process is strictly prohibited by the NTA. It is set forth at the time that the intervener is allowed into the action, and if at any time an applicant believes that their market or their potential customers are being poached by the intervener, the NTA will dismiss the intervener and, if necessary, sanction them. So there are guarded protections and safeguards within the law as currently written that allow the intervener process to move in a way that is effective, that protects the public, and ensures the fluidness of an application throughout the application process. But those same provisions strictly prohibit anti-competitive behavior, unduly delaying the process, and overly burdening it by discovery acts or other actions that would otherwise be inferior or infirm to this legislative body's declaration of purpose. And that is to ensure that the NTA properly uh, oversees commercial transportation in the state of Nevada and fosters sound economic conditions in the industry which are not anti-competitive based. As the former chair of the NTA, I'm very familiar with the intervener process and would be happy to answer any specific or technical questions that the committee may have about the process and how it works. As always, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear today. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, yes. Thank you, Senator Harris. Appreciate your time. Um, anyone else uh, in opposition in Las Vegas? Anyone on the phones who'd like to give opposition testimony, BPS? Sure, there are no callers for opposition at this time. Okay, we'll go ahead and go to neutral testimony. Anyone here in Carson City like to give neutral testimony? Anyone for neutral in Las Vegas, Senate Bill 424? Anyone neutral on the phone? Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Okay, uh, Senator Flores, any closing remarks? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I will only point out, Senator Edgar Flores, for the record, that direct and substantial interest um, and then I understand that we can't do it strictly to hinder competition. And you're not supposed to, but because it's so broadly written now, they do. Um, because unfortunately, any excuse is uh, a mechanism for them to go on a fishing expedition during discovery. They can say something, they can say something like fraud and then say, oh, give me an opportunity during discovery to bring that up and go on a fishing expedition. At the time that you bring up a, a concern, there is no requirement for you to present evidence. And so 
uh, what you do see right now, every single time that this conversation comes up, is that the NTA will say, we, we, some of the stuff that's brought up during the intervener process, we've identified that on our own. You'll, you'll, you'll hear the NTA say that over and over. We, we found that. And then the other side of it is that, unfortunately, um, it is just a dance utilized to hinder competition, bottom line, and, and, and it needs to be addressed. And, and uh, you know, we, I, I, I think I can't, we can't go another two years with, with this nonsense happening in the state of Nevada. It's embarrassing. Um, with that, I will close it out. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Senator Flores. Um, I know that we've had discussions on this in the past. Um, one thing that I'll talk to you about and, and potentially NTA as well is the idea of putting in a deemed, deemed approved date um, as a backstop. And, you know, that can sometimes also maybe help prevent people being able to drag things out. Nine months, you're approved if the application, if the hearing isn't complete by then. And so there might be some things to, that, that we can chat about. I'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Senate Bill 424 uh, and go ahead and open up our work session. I've got to find our vice chair. Um, but before I do that, members, we're going to go ahead and pull Senate Bill 10 and Senate Bill 164 from the work session today. Uh, you will likely see those on Wednesday. Um, we're going to go ahead and just stand in just a brief recess while I go find our vice chair, and then we will uh, roll through the work session, and I'll let you all enjoy the rest of your day. Hang in there. Okay, committee will come back to order. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our policy analyst, Ms. Rossiter, to go ahead and walk us through the work session. Thank you, Chair Harris. For the record, Kristen Rossiter, committee policy analyst and nonpartisan staff of the Legislative Council Bureau. As such, we do not advocate on behalf of or in opposition to any proposed legislation we'll be discussing today. The first item on the work session is Senate Bill 40 which is sponsored by this committee on behalf of the Housing Division of the Department of Business and Industry and was heard on February 22nd. This bill changes the name of the document issued by the Housing Division of the Department of Business and Industry from a Certificate of Ownership to a Certificate of Title, allows certain documents to be issued in electronic form, and revises requirements of certain transactions. The bill also clarifies the collection of data and revises eligibility requirements for persons seeking assistance from the account for affordable housing. The types of property affected include new, used, rebuilt, manufactured homes and buildings, mobile homes, commercial coaches, and factory-built housing. Three amendments were proposed at the hearing, and copies of these documents are attached. And uh, for committee members and the public, all of these items are available on Nellis. The First Amendment was from the Manufactured Home Community Owners Association, which proposed an amendment to remove the proposed language in Section 17 of the bill. The Second Amendment was proposed by the Nevada Housing Coalition relating to income eligibility requirements for assistance from the account for affordable housing. The Third Amendment was from the Nevada Housing Alliance, uh, and uh, this um, amendment proposed Re, uh, reflects the discussions held during the bill hearing related to the standards adopted by local governments for the placement of manufactured homes that will not be affixed to a lot within a mobile home park. And after the bill hearing, an additional conceptual amendment was received from the Nevada Assessors Association uh, relating to the report of sale of a new manufactured home, new mobile home, new manufactured building, new commercial coach, or new factory built housing. Thank you, Chair Harris. Committee members, any questions on Senate Bill 40? Okay, not seeing any, I'll take a motion. To amend and do pass, we've got a motion from Senator Spearman, is there a second? Second from Senator Hansen, any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed, nay? Okay, uh, that one passes unanimously. Senate Bill 66, Ms. Rossiter. 
We're going to sign the floor statement on Senate Bill 42 myself. Chair Harris, the next item on the work session is Senate Bill 66, which is sponsored by this committee on behalf of the Department of Motor Vehicles and was heard on March 13th. This bill establishes a number, number of provisions related to the disqualification of an individual from operating a commercial vehicle or obtaining a commercial vehicle driver's license. An individual will be disqualified for life without the possibility of reinstatement if they have committed certain felony offenses, including coercion, human trafficking, or the transportation of a controlled substance. The bill revises a number of provisions, including several related to railroad crossings to conform more closely to federal definitions. The bill also prohibits an employer from, al from allowing a person to operate a commercial motor vehicle under certain circumstances. The Department of Motor Vehicles has submitted an amendment and a copy is attached, which authorizes the DMV to adopt regulations necessary to comply with federal law related to the commercial driver's license drug and alcohol clearinghouse provides that certain additional actions constitute the crime of holding a person in, volunt in involuntary servitude or holding a minor in involuntary servitude and revises the circumstances in which the DMV will furnish the full information regarding a person's driving record to the license administrator of certain other jurisdictions. Thank you, Chair. Committee members, questions on Senate Bill 66. I will note that um, the amendment that you all um, should have before you in the work session documents does reflect discussions between the, it's my understanding anyway that that, that amendment reflects discussions between the public defenders and, um, and the DMV. Questions on Senate Bill 66? Okay, with that I'll accept a motion. Okay, we've got a motion to amend and do pass from Senator Spearman, is there a second? Second from Senator Hansen. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Okay, Senate Bill 66 also passes unanimously. I'll assign the floor statement to Senator Hansen. You're welcome. Ms. Rossiter, Senate Bill 85, please. Thank you, Chair Harris. Senate Bill 85 was sponsored by Senator Daley, was heard by this committee on March 1st. It revises provisions relating to the amount of money that the Director of Nevada's Department of Transportation must retain for certain highway contracts and how that money will be dispersed to contractors and subcontractors who perform work on the projects so that following a satisfactory final inspection of the project, the director shall pay the remaining balance to the contractor no later than 30 days after the final inspection. And a subcontractor who performs work on the project is authorized to contact the director of NDOT to resolve payment disputes if the contractor withholds more than 5% of a required payment. Finally, this uh, bill and the provisions of it are not retroactive for contracts made or awarded before the effective date of the bill, which is upon passage and approval. An amendment has been proposed by the Associated General Contractors and is attached. In summary, the amendment revises Section 1 so that the remaining 5% of the contract price, but no more than $50,000 be retained until the entire contract is completed satisfactorily and accepted by the director. Thank you, Chair Harris. Committee members, any questions on Senate Bill 85? All right, not seeing any, I'll accept a motion. Got a motion from Senator Hansen, is there a second? Second. All right, we'll go ahead and give the second to Senator Hammond. Any discussion on the motion to amend and do pass? All right, not seeing any, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Okay, Senate Bill 85 uh, passes unanimously. We will assign the floor statement to Senator Bazina. Let's let's assign. Really. Okay, um, 
we will give that floor statement, Senate Bill 85, to Senator Hansen. Sure. You're welcome. All right, uh, Senate Bill 107, Ms. Rossiter. Thank you, Chair Harris. Senate Bill 107 was sponsored by Senator Daley and heard by this committee on March 1st. It requires Nevada's Department of Transportation to establish a program and charge a fee to allow a private contractor awarded a contract for work on a highway to obtain a permit to use an inoperable law enforcement vehicle owned by the Nevada Highway Patrol equipped with at least one flashing and red warning lamp and to operate the warning lights while parked on a highway. There are two amendments for this bill. An amendment was proposed by Washoe County. In summary, the amendment provides that authorized emergency vehicles could include a coroner or medical examiner. And subsequently, an amendment was proposed by the Associated General Contractors, which removes language referring to purchasing a vehicle or NDOT, charging a fee for the permit, clarifies that lights on the vehicle can only be on and flashing when construction crews are present, and adds a subsection to clarify that the provisions of the bill only apply if the contractor first requested the presence of an authorized emergency vehicle operated by a peace officer employed by the Nevada Highway Patrol at the area where the work on the highway is being performed and an officer or authorized emergency vehicle was not available. Thank you, Chair Harris. Committee members, questions on Senate Bill 107. Okay, uh, not seeing any, I will take a motion. Got an amend and do pass from Senator Hansen. Is there a second on that motion? Got a second from Senator Hammond. Any discussion on the motion? All right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed, nay? Okay, Senate Bill 107 passes unanimously. Ms. Rossiter, 257, please. Floor assignment's gonna, that one I will give to Sandra Daly. Thank you, Chair Harris. Senate Bill 257 is also sponsored by Senator Daly and was heard by the committee on March 22nd. It revises payroll and compliance reporting requirements for certain renewable energy facilities that receive certain tax abatements to require such reports to be submitted quarterly instead of annually. An amendment has been proposed by Senator Daley which requires quarterly payroll and compliance reports to be submitted during the term of the construction of a renewable energy facility and annual reports to be submitted at all other times. The term of construction commences when a building permit is issued by the applicable city or county and does not end until the facility is producing power or another time that is determined by the director. Thank you, Chair Harris. Committee members, questions on Senate Bill 257? All right, uh, not seeing any, I'll go ahead and accept a motion. We've got a motion to amend and do pass from Senator Spearman, is there a second? Second, second from Senator Hansen, any discussion on the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye, any opposed, nay? All right, Senate Bill 257 passes unanimously. I will again assign that to Senator Daley. And Chair Harris, the last item on today's work session is Senate Bill 346, which is sponsored by Senator Spearman and was heard by this committee on April 3rd. This bill revises requirements related to certificates of registration and certificates of title of a vehicle, eliminates limitations on persons who may participate in the program, authorizes applications and participation by all persons, eliminates the requirements that certain information be on the face or reverse of applicable documents, and eliminates the requirement of the use of pen and ink, which authorizes electronic signatures for these documents. And an amendment has been proposed by the Department of Motor Vehicles. In summary, the amendment revises provisions relating to electric powered vehicles, including the fees for such plates. The amendment adds a definition of auto cycle and establishes provisions governing the operation of an auto cycle. Thank you, Chair Harris. Thank you. Any questions, members, on Senate Bill 346? Okay, I'll accept a motion. All 
right? And I believe that's just a due pass. Is there an amendment on that one, yes, Ms. Rossiter? Okay, that's an amendment due pass. Is there a second on that motion? Second from Senator Hansen. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? All right, Senate Bill 346 passes unanimously. I will assign the floor statement to Senator Hammond. Senator Spearman. We'll give it to Senator Spearman. <laughs> Senator Spearman. Got it. All right. Uh, members, that's all of the items on our work session for today. Thanks for hanging in there. Uh, we will be back here on Wednesday. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, we'll be back here on Wednesday for um, what I'm hoping is our last meeting ahead of the deadline day. If you do, members have any bills or are talking to your friends and colleagues who may have bills in this committee, Wednesday is the day. Um, so have those conversations today, tomorrow, or Wednesday morning. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to public comment. Anyone here in Carson City would like to give public comment? No? Anyone down in Las Vegas for public comment? Nobody in Las Vegas. Okay. BPS, can we check the phones to see if there's anyone who'd like to give public comment today? Yeah, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers at this time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are adjourned. Have a great day.